Chaudhry and my pronouns. My name is Rabia Chaudhry and my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I will be the moderator for this event. So to give you a little bit more information about myself, I am a queer, disabled Pakistani settler and artist, and I work at the Human Rights and Equity Office at Brock University. I would also like to introduce Kelly Ferguson and Sean Power, who will be providing ASL interpretation throughout this event. Before we begin, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. We begin this event by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. We wish to acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This agreement bounds us to share the territory and protect the land as we have the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. The portion of Turtle Island or North America that we now call Canada has been home since time immemorial to the ancestors of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. We recognize that in this territory, Indigenous people have endured historical oppression and continue to endure inequalities that have largely resulted from the widespread failure of non-Indigenous treaty people to uphold their responsibilities within the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. In our various roles at Brock University or wherever you are situated, we should be committed to decolonization as we continue to rebuild and renew our respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. This is Juno, by the way. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the legacy of slavery in our region that, and the enslaved African people whose labor, whose labor was exploited for generations to help establish the economy of our region and Canada as a whole. The end of slavery was followed by a series of discriminatory and repressive laws that legitimized anti-Black racism. I acknowledge the harm that colon colonialism and white supremacy has brought to these lands, in particular the erasure of both indigenous and African identities and cultures. By acknowledging that we are on stolen land, we acknowledge that the foundation of our country is ro rooted in colonialism, racism, ableism, and white supremacy, all of which needs to be dismantled in order to partake in the various principles of disability justice, decolonization, and anti-Black racism. Thank you. So before I introduce you to our special guests, I would also like to thank our organizers and sponsors, including Brock Student Justice Center, the President's Advisory Committee on Human Rights, Equity, and Decolonization, the Sexual Violence Prevention Committee, the Center for Pedagogical Innovation, and Brock University's Student Union. Now, <laughs> let's get started. Today, we have Imani Barbarin joining us. Imani is a disability rights and inclusion activist and speaker who uses her voice, sorry, this is Jai, <laughs> who uses her voice and social media platforms to create conversations engaging the disability community. Born with cerebral palsy, Imani often writes and uses her platform to speak from the perspectives of a disabled black woman. In the last few years, she has created over a dozen trending hashtags that allow disabled folk the opportunity to have their perspectives heard while forcing the world to take notice. Hashtag patients are not faking, hashtag things disabled people know, hashtag ables are weird, and others each provide a window into disabled life while forming community. Imani Sorry, is from Rabia. Yep. Sorry to interrupt, but you're speaking way too fast for the cool. interpreter to be able to keep up. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I will slow down. Okay. Imani is from Philadelphia area and holds a master's in global communications from the American University of Paris. Her published works include those in Forbes, Rewire, Healthline, Bitch Media, and more. She runs the blog Crutches and Spice and a podcast of the same name. For this event, we will begin with a 10 minute presentation or speech from Imani, followed by a moderated discussion with our student respondents. Towards the end, we will open up the floor for members of the community to ask questions, so make sure you type yours in the Q&A box or in the chat. We have also collected a lot of great questions from the Eventbrite, so we might not be able to answer every question. So <laughs> no more reading off the script. Welcome Imani, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for having me. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I am going to talk as slowly as possible. I am from the Northeast, so that is not a normal, <laughs> that's not normal for me. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to make sure that the translators are have the, everything that they need um, to move forward. Again, my name is Imani Barbarin. Um, I come to you from outside of Philadelphia, um, from unceded Lenape land. 
um, in the suburbs of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I greatly appreciate you all asking me to be here. I think it is incredibly bold and forward moving of you to really wanna invest in disability advocacy, especially evaluating intersectionality and the ways in which we can work together. Um, I grew up as a disabled black girl in the suburbs. <laughs> I went to predominantly white institutions for most of my education. I, um, I felt very alone growing up thinking this, this is it, like this is the only person I'm going to see with a disability who's exactly like me. Um, and that was extremely hard. Now there were times when I would come across other disabled black kids or other disabled um, people of color, but it wasn't until my 20s that I was invited to an event and every person looked like me. Every, every person that spoke um, had an experience that was very similar to mine. And it was all disabled black folk and that was in my 20s. So imagine the isolation that disabled black people and disabled people of color feel growing up um, in the United States um, and feeling very much erased, not only in disability history, but in black history as well. Um, intersectionality is incredibly important. We need to tell these stories. It is critically important that we understand these intersections because our lives literally depend on it. Um, about 25% of African-Americans within the United States have a disability. That is a high number. We are second only to indigenous people who have a rate of disability at 30%. When we think about the histories of these two demographics, what comes to mind, right? We think about an organized effort to eradicate both indigenous people and black people, um, utilizing their health, utilizing the lack of resources, utilizing starving these communities from the care that they need. And when you think about that, every single aspect of racism is disabling. Every single form of racism is disabling. When we think about environmental racism, we think about people that are forced to live close to highways um, and in areas where there's low air quality, which leads to asthma. When we think about medical racism, if your doctor does not believe you and just is debating whether or not you're actually getting trying to get drugs or trying to get care, then that's gonna exacerbate the issue and that's gonna lead to disability. Systemic disability, um, when we think about people who are into hustle culture and working 24 seven just to provide for their daily needs, that is disabling. Every form of, of racism is meant to be disabling because we are meant to eradicate these communities. Because there's an instinct that ableism tells us that disabled people die anyways, right? We've seen it play out through the pandemic that disabled people, why are we stopping our lives? to save disabled people. What reality is, is that death and harm comes to them anyways. That's, that's just the nature of their lives. But, it, but is it? Is that how we really live our lives? Are we just more apt to be harmed and hurt, are we? Or is that a choice we as a society make every single day with every single action that we take? Do we really think to ourselves, this is normal? Or do we actually wanna get into the crux of the issue and ask, how are we gonna support one another? I always say to people, our health, your individual health is a group project. Think about that. We've seen it play out with the pandemic again with the CDC and, and mask wearing and all of these things, right? My health is reliant upon you taking the time to protect yourself to make sure that you have the resources that you need. Every form of racism is disabling. And that's the really, that's the instinct that we need to evaluate, that instinct that says that this is fine for them. To say, the truth is disabled people don't just die. We have a system that specifically is designed to harm us, to isolate us. And then when we go missing or harmed or hurt, um, to not question. March 1st marked the Disability Day of Mourning um, in which disabled people um, 
honor those in our community who have been killed by their caregivers. And when I wrote that, when I, I spoke at an event um, for the Pittsburgh chapter of an autism organization. And I really, when I was writing the speech, I had to ask myself, because I looked at some of the names and I, I looked at some of the articles and I asked, what, what was their favorite color? What was, what was the, their, their favorite subject in school? What do they like to do on a daily basis? These stories of disabled death didn't tell anything about their lives, didn't say anything about who they were as people. But you know what was talked about ad nauseum? How they were seen by the people that harmed them. And that is where we are right now. We are being seen. We are, our, our existence is being debated and we are being, our existence is being evaluated by people that are not us. And that is harmful. And then on top of that, you have the issue of disability being um, seen as only white people, which it's not. I'm here, obviously. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been walked up to and somebody has said, well, I didn't know that you know black people had cerebral palsy. It's a brain injury. You don't think we can have it? It's, it doesn't make sense. So what I want you to do today as you are listening to the questions, if, as you are listening to the answers, is to really question that instinct that you've been taught since birth, that you've been taught to prioritize the needs of non-disabled people in the lives of disabled people. That instinct that you've been taught that disability and race are two separate things and don't play hand in hand. And so that we don't really need to evaluate any further. We don't need to look any deeper. I want you to question that. I also want, to want you to question your own ableism towards yourself. Because as somebody, as somebody who may be a person of color with a disability or may not be, your attitudes towards your own productivity, your own drive, your own desire to not be seen as disposal, your feelings about that towards yourself is the way you're gonna treat others. And I know, I know it sounds cliche, right? We always, we always tell people that. Oh, how you feel about me is just you projecting. We hear it on social media all the time. We use a lot of psychological terms for everyday conversations, but it's true. How do you feel about yourself? How many of you are overextending yourselves, trying to perform ability? What are you doing? Your body cannot take it 24 seven like that. You cannot, you cannot outrun or out exercise or outperform what your body may do naturally. You cannot out, outperform what society's gonna see in you. And you know what? No matter how they see you, your value is not questioned. I do not look at you and question whether or not we should shut down the economy if you were ill. I would. I do not look at you and question why you're sitting down and resting and, and while you think that you're looking lazy. I don't question why you're resting. You shouldn't either. How you feel about yourself is very much so the first step in undoing the ableism you've been taught. Because most, for most of the time, we are not taught ableism as it, 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 as it pertains to other people. We are taught ableism to keep ourselves in line, to keep ourselves continuously working, to keep ourselves continuously going along this hamster wheel of life. So I want you to really think about it. I want you to go home and journal or however you like to express yourself. I want you to think about how you treat yourself, particularly if you're a black or a person of color, because the burden is even heavier on you. That desire is historical to be seen as not disposable and to be seen as valuable. And you are tearing yourself apart. So I really want you to look at that today. I really want you to think about how to be kind to yourself because they're gonna think what they think regardless. We can always work to change it, but you still 
you still need to take time for yourself, take space for yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imani, that was amazing. I wanna to touch on something that you mentioned in the beginning when you said that we are seen, but we're not listened to. And I think there's this notion that we are voiceless, we don't have a voice, but in reality we do, we're just not listened to. And I think yeah. that's such a huge issue that it's so hard to tackle, especially with policies and politicians and people just not open to listening to us. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that, but your, your speech was extremely empowering. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I like this, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. I don't know who said it, but I think this phrase perfectly sums it up, which is like, people are not, there is no such thing as the, as the voice for the voiceless. There's only the intentionally silenced and the preferably unheard. Um, mm -hmm. And that is very much so real for us and our community. Mm -hmm. That is so true. I was actually thinking of that quote, but I couldn't remember it word for word. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, we will be moving into the question portion with our student respondents. So we have four students from Brock University that will be joining us and sharing questions that they've prepared. Um, and we will start off with Faith. Hi, Imani. Hi, Robbie. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, my name is Faith Lokaisane. My pronouns are she, her, just so everyone knows going forward. Um, thank you so much for talking today, Imani. I really enjoyed listening to you. Um, my question is, how do you navigate the decision to consciously claim certain labels um, despite being unsure or maybe feeling uneasy about the definitions and connotations of those labels? Yeah, so I grew up um, past Imani was a very different person. Um, and I was very much so afraid of like these labels. And for much of my life, I didn't really use the term disabled or disability or anything like that. It wasn't like people were talking around it. This is nobody ever brought it up. Um, <laughs> and when I kind of grew up into my own, I kind of realized that these parts of me are not negotiable. You know, I remember like it was a... <laughs> It's, it's a really funny moment now, but it was actually my first tattoo that got me to realize like, fuck it. Like, like I, so, um, so one day I just, I decided for my 19th birthday, I got a tattoo and my dad got, and anybody who's the child of black parents, um, who are like very suburban, know that that's a no, no. Um, and I, my dad was like freaking out. He goes, you're going to, you're not going to get a job. You're not going to be able to pay your rent like you've just ruined it and by the way this is the tattoo you can't even see it um and I was I just looked at him and like something just snapped and I was like who cares I just dad like I I will walk into every single room as a black woman as a fat black woman as a disabled fat black woman and if they want to discriminate against me it's not the tattoo that's going to do it you know, like, like it's not going to be like, you know, that, that, that there's this one little part of me that, oh, all of a sudden that's where the flip switches and I'm, I'm just not going to engage with this person. No, there's history behind the way I am treated that is far beyond my control and the labels will not change that. Um, and also, especially with dis disability, I kept having people say to me, oh, I don't think of you as disabled. I don't think of you as disabled. Uh, I see you as other than that. And I was like, and when you, when you start real, start engaging in those types of relationships, you start to realize that the same people who will not see you as disabled will not check to see if anything's accessible. They don't care. Like they just care that you don't inconvenience them um, with your identity and your needs. So at, at some point you're gonna have to be honest with yourself because everybody else around you is gonna have to do the same. And how you choose the words to describe yourself can provide safety, you can provide community and can provide um, self-love at the end of the day. Thank you so much. No problem. 
I want to touch on something you actually just said about how people say that, um, you know, I don't see you as disabled. That reminds me of the phrase, you know, I don't see color. And it's so interesting because when you're disabled and racialized, when people say they don't see you as disabled and they don't see your color or your skin color, where is that going to take us? Because that's part of my identity. That's part of who I am. And so that just shows how so many forms of these oppressions are interlinked and affect racialized or racialized and able or disabled bodies. So thank you for that. Um, up next, we have Bailey. Hi, can you see me? Hi, Bailey. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, the That first question actually feeds into my question sort of um, when you're talking about people's commenting or like responding to it when you call yourself disabled. Um, it kind of reminded me of when I was at a dinner party once. Um, so I'm half native and half white and mm -hmm. uh, a neighbor was at the party and he I could see him kind of looking at me and my mom trying to figure out why she was blonde with blue eyes and why I looked like me. And so then it, it always comes up, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm half um, native. And his response was, oh, it's okay. It's okay, you can't really tell, you don't have to worry. Like basically saying I could probably pass for white so I shouldn't be too concerned about looking indigenous. And I was like too stunned to speak. I'm like, that was not the point of anything that I said. And I'm, I'm like, are you joking? So I was, my question was kind of, how do you like respond to that or like explain to people that that's not what saying something about yourself isn't an invitation for like a conversation or a debate if that makes sense yeah it's funny so um a lot of people there's like this tiktok video going around saying like people who are non-confrontational um are inherently problematic um and i was I've, i saw that video and i was like eh. because for me i don't waste time on people i'm never gonna see again um, or like who aren't invested in actually trying to understand the conversation at hand, right? Like I can understand if, you know, somebody like passers by, like just don't get it. And you're like, well, actually, you know, I, it's, I'm not debating, it, it, it is what it is. Um, but when somebody in my life reflects that back to me, um, then I have a problem. Because if I'm going to surround myself with people that are important to me, I need them to get it. Like, you know what I mean? I need, I need them to understand why this is important to me. Um, and to your point, you know, I think it's really problematic and, and really dangerous in a way just to kind of say, oh, I don't see that part of you. It's okay. It's okay. Like, <laughs> that's dangerous. Cause if, you, if you're native, right? And you're going and you're traveling across the US that, with a friend who doesn't see color or doesn't see in, in, uh, your nativeness, right? I don't, I'm so, I apologize. I fumbled my words. But if somebody doesn't see that part of you and you're traveling around the country and they send you to a destination where you're in danger because they don't see color, nah, that's not okay. That's not all right in any way. Um, so really kind of understand where your energy is gonna lie because you can't fight everybody. You can't make everybody um, understand you, but make sure that the people around you and surround and who you surround yourself with, that's where you're going to spend your energy. Um, yeah. And just ignore, I, I like, I try not to say like, just ignore them, but, um, unless they're like in your face, be like, I don't really care what you have to say. Like the, I walk away from this conversation, still being me still in the skin, still with this disability, you get to walk away and this will have nothing, no bearing on who you are, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah really just spend the time with the people that matter to you. Thanks. Thank you, Mani. Up so, next, we have Aaliyah. Um, Hi, it was such an honor to um, be be here for your, for your speech and um, just, um, I, I found myself relating a lot to what you said, although I do not, I am not a person of color. I am disabled. I have cerebral palsy as well. And um, I'm also queer. So I get that intersection, but in a different way. But um, my question kind of related to that, uh, kind of related to my disability and my sexuality. So a lot of people 
um, like I don't go around saying I'm gay or whatever, but um, if it does come up, a lot of people will be like, a lot of people that don't really know me will be like, oh, I, I didn't know that people with disabilities could be anything but asexual and aromantic. And although those are two very, very valid identities and I respect those identities very much, I just, um, it frustrates me because I don't like being put in a box or assumed an identity just because of other factors of my identity, if that makes sense. So how do you challenge that in your work? When I, so I always get a question either similar to that or um, people really do not see disabled people in any sort of space where sexuality is on display or even like autonomy is on display um, on, on a larger scale. Um, what I would say, what I usually say is like disabled people are people. Like the, the idea that disabled people are, are born into this, you know, like very cherubic identity of like, they're little angels, like they're, they're eternal children. And that's not true. Disabled people are literally just people who happen to be disabled. Um, and it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, when you when you really just think about it from a very basic logical standpoint, right? Because one out of five people will become disabled as they age. Um, very a very small portion of the disability community are born with their disabilities. So the idea that <laughs> so the idea that we're all this one way, despite having gotten to disability in various ways doesn't make sense. And I always bring them back to like, what told you that? You know, like, what indication did you have that we weren't, that we didn't have sexuality, that we didn't have, um, you know, that we didn't have uh, all these other parts of our identity that everybody else has, you know? That, and it's just a very strange question. And I, I, I just kind of look at them like, I don't, what? <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think also too, what we need to understand is the, the nature of marginalization. A lot of spaces for people of color, for um, black folks, for queer people, for trans people, they're quite literally carved out of society, right? So the spaces that are, that are existing for um, marginalized communities are carved out of an existing society that has no intention of letting them enter the public sphere, or enter um, public life, right? So the spaces in which we congregate are all places that are inaccessible. They're basically, this is where we could find space, this is where we're gonna go, right? And it's only until really recently that we've actually seen intersectional spaces cultivated that include disabled people. So I, would, I just want people to also keep that in mind just to make sure that they realize like there is a history as to why uh, a lot of marginalized spaces are inaccessible. It's not acceptable, but understand where that comes from. Thank you so much, Imani. Up next, we have Aisha. Hello. Hi, Imani and uh, Rabia, how are you? Hi. <laughs> Uh, my question is about how do you use humor and hashtags such as able to be weird and as tools to actualize resistance and social change? Okay, um, that's a good question. I like being sarcastic. Um, so <laughs> it's, what's actually really funny is that when I started my profiles, excuse me, my platforms, I don't cuss a lot. Um, but if you look at my earlier tweets, I'm cussing like every other word. Or if even if you see my tweets now, I, I cuss a lot. Um, and I don't do that in person. But basically, the idea when I did when I started doing that more often was this idea that disabled people are infantilized um, and very much so do not know what we're saying or doing. And so people would try to correct me when I was being sarcastic or rude. And I really did that on purpose <laughs> so that they couldn't put me in like this box, right? And really kind of think of me in this very one way. And I think when it comes to disability humor, I think disabled humor is top tier. Like it just is. Like, there's, like I love the feeling of when somebody, somebody um, responds to me and goes, I don't know whether to laugh. And I'm like, 
I know. Um, and I, I, it really kind of takes the fangs out of some of the ableism we experience. And that's not to say that what we experience isn't dangerous in a lot of cases, but it's also freaking humorous. Um, and, it, and it feels like you get to commiserate with other disabled people about the stories um, that they're telling. And I think that's really important. It's not necessarily to make non-disabled people feel more, com feel more comfortable or take the fangs out of it for them. It's more for disabled people to process because I could care less what non-disabled people do. I, I could, like I could, I could care less what they do. So, you know, it's really for me like an opportunity for disabled people to kind of like, you know, build bonds and relate to one another. Um, and I think that that's incredibly important. And also I think it's just funny that a majority of the time disability humor relies on non-disabled people being the punchline, which, which is like a change in, in a balance of power, um, which I love. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. I love that so much. Um, <laughs> the next question is actually from me. Um, and it is, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded issues such as ableism and racism for disabled racialized youth? Sure. So I, it's, it's really interesting because a lot of people see the pandemic as, um, a space in which a lot of things became accessible all of a sudden, but for a lot of disabled people who were like really on borderline with, you know, with a lot of the services that they were getting, um, they, a lot of those services just stopped for, for them. Like a lot of the services like just did not exist anymore. Um, that included, you know, direct support workers, if you were getting them, that included, you know, day programs and activities, if you were somebody who's living in a residential um, facility, um, like literally every single, every, everything stopped uh, immediately. And a lot of those services have not started up again, um, even though we're trying to press to go back to normal. Um, then it, you also have the fact that, you know, medical, medical rationing guidelines, excuse me, medical rationing guidelines um, basically discriminate against disabled people on the basis of you know, um, stereotypes and stereotypes around quality of life as somebody with a disability. And that would disproportionately affect black and brown um, disabled people. Um, you have the internet equity issue too. Like I think only about like 60% of disabled people have access to the internet. And so when everything's online, is it really accessible? Um, there, were, there were tons of ways in which the, Black, when racialized disabled people were just left in the dust. Um, and on top of it, you have Black Lives Matter and um, you have the movement for Black Lives, which is kind of good at talking about the disability intersection in which like 30 to 50% of people killed by police have a disability. But then we're also very much so forgotten in those narratives because like I said before, disability is seen as white. And so people think that when we say disability and police justice, that we're thinking of only white disabled people when in reality we exist too. So um, it really has been a mess. It's just been awful. Um, thinking about like, if I get COVID and um, I'm in the hospital, will I get equitable treatment? Because not only am I disabled, I'm black, I'm a black woman. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been a lot. Um, and I think that hopefully at least more disabled black folk are taking the time to actually assess what matters to them and assess like, you need your rest too and you need boundaries and you need people to support you because everything, everything has just dropped for those communities. I think that's so true. And I, one of my favorite parts, I guess, about the pandemic though, is the sense of community that people were able to build online and especially through your, um, your own hashtags. And I think that's so amazing because so many people on TikTok, especially were connecting through your hashtags or your videos. I remember seeing so many of your videos where you stitch or duet people and you ask like, is this accessible? And they have to respond to you whether it is or not. And seeing those responses was really great because even in the pandemic, you're challenging these people and their notions about ableism because they don't think about that stuff. And so I think that was really great. And um, we can go on to the next question. This um, one is from, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I said, okay, no worries. <laughs> okay. okay. 
Um, this one is from the audience. How has your journey shifted since you began doing social media activism and what creative opportunities are next for you? Oh, I'm so glad somebody's asking me about my creativeness. Like that, makes, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, so my act, so I, I think, uh, I started a hashtag the other day, like why this advocacy? Um, and that's because uh, I think one of the greatest tragedies about disability advocacy is that every single disabled person comes to disability advocacy for a different reason. And a lot of times it, it, it's because they wanted a foot in the door um, or they just wanted access to like their passions and they be able to, to be able to exercise their gifts and their talents and all these things. And um, we felt like, at least I feel like we spend so much of our time advocate, advocating just to stay alive, just to have access to basic, basic things that we forget why we wanted to be there in the first place, right? Um, and I know, I, I really hope that every single person on this webinar remembers why you want it. Like, why do you want it? Why, why are you fighting for this? Um, and initially, what I started my advocacy doing was I really wanted to tell stories about being Black and disabled. Um, and I started with my own stories and my blog with crutchesandspice.com and um, just kind of remembering what it was like for me and in my particular situation. Um, and then I was able to like build a community online and really kind of understand that there are issues way bigger than just me and my story um, that are affecting people that I don't know and who are have been fighting since before I even got online. So it was really important for me to to really understand the communities that I was being a part of. And I think too, when we get online, we have this instinct to just post right away. Um, and to just like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in the conversation right here, right now. And we forget to listen. Like we really forget to listen. And so I think one of the skills that I really built up and I'm grateful for is being able to listen to other disabled people and really kind of sit back and understand like where I don't need to be speaking. Um, that being said, you know, I, I wanted to get into, you know, storytelling and acting and film and TV because I've, I've always had a passion for those things. And so I'm writing a TV show, I'm writing a book. I feel very cliche, I feel very LA when I say that. It, like, it's very upsetting. Um, and uh, I'm hopefully, I would love to be in the writers and be in writers rooms and different places like that. I think which, what's really important too is that we need to tell disability stories in every way we can. Um, and I think it's possible. Um, we need disabled people everywhere, right? Everywhere. And that's what I want to see. And I really hope to, to open my, produ my own production company one day and to hire disabled people, specifically disabled people of color and APAP people. Um, just because like, I feel like we can build differently. We can like challenge the ways that work functions if we take disability and accommodations into account. So that's what I'm working on. That is so exciting. I can't wait. Like, I'm so excited. I can't stop smiling. Um, that makes me like seriously so excited. And I'm so, so, so looking forward to reading your book or watching your show. Um, and the next question that we have is, I am wondering how you see racism in technology as disabling. How can we resist this while engaging technology as a tool for building community and centering liberation? Yeah, so there is, I think the price of technology in and of itself is very much so racialized. My favorite example is the idea like white disabled people and white non-disabled people come to kind of come, to, come together um, in the most irritating of ways when it comes to like these wheelchairs that um, climb steps. And if you've seen my Twitter, you know that is my biggest pet peeve, right? We, I think what, what the issue that I see um, that is the greatest is approaching technology as though accessibility is an individual issue, right? Because a, a chair that can climb steps can help one person and will cost like what, 40 to $50,000? Who has that money? Um, and, but a ramp could cost like maybe $5,000, $10,000 and could affect the lives of every single person in that space, right? And so the greatest issue that I have is like thinking very much so from an individualistic point of view when it comes to disability and accessibility and technology and not really understanding that, um, that 
the dis distribution of resources is, is just as important and building out functions that can distribute resources is important. Um, but yeah, I, that's the one thing I really can't stand. Um, and don't think right, don't think like right here, think about everybody. Um, and that is very much like a very white supremacist approach towards technology and accessibility. So that's the biggest thing that I see is an issue. Like think bigger, think more inclusively. Um, and also think brown because why can't I use a paper towel? On, like why, why, why? My palm is the same color. Anyways, I'm not gonna, no, I'm good. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, thinking bigger and more inclusive is so important, especially because that goes into community care and caring for people that aren't just white. And that's so important, especially with technology and the fact that it's so expensive and inaccessible. So thank you so much for sharing that. Our next question is, um, this isn't for me, but I'm just going to read it like from their perspective. Oh my gosh, this is so cool since I'm writing about digital feminist activism on TikTok for my major research paper. How do you deal with ableist, uh, ableist comments you receive? Do you engage or ignore? How do people react when you started my hashtag my disabled life is worthy? How has TikTok affected or changed your activism? So those are a lot of questions. So feel free to pick from that. Yeah, I, so can you read the first question again? I, I, yeah. I caught part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with ableist comments you receive? Do you engage or ignore them? So it really depends. Um, if I have energy or like, I feel like it, I can make an example out of somebody, I, I do. Um, so one of the things, one of the tools that I try to use when it comes to like approaching ableist comments or people who are ableist in my duets or stitches or what have you is, um, if they're talking to me directly, I talk back to them directly. If they're just being a jackass, what I will do is talk above them. Um, and what I will do is I will talk about them as an example and use their behavior as an example example for larger systemic issues. And that pisses them off the most because they seem to feel they seem to want to like bring me down to their level and make it feel, feel like an interpersonal issue when in reality their ableism is more emblematic of a system that allows them to, to think this way and install them to think this way. And so whenever I have the wherewithal and I'm not feeling sassy that day, um, I decide, like I try to, you know, approach it from that. Like, to, and then they get pissed because what, I, what I'll do is, I'll be like, so say you're, so say Rabia, you are posting an ableist comment. You, you would never, but say you did. And I would, I would, I would look at you and be like, Rabia is just, and I feel bad for Rabia because realistically, the ableism that she is viewing is not uncommon. And this is the sentiment that we really have to approach with caution and really kind of evaluate where this idea comes, that's what I would do, where this idea comes from. And I would just launch into like something more strategic, but sometimes I can just get really angry and decide, decide to, um, approach them as a person, which is, it always gets me in some sort of trouble. <laughs> I just have to say, I love your TikToks, especially when you call people in or out like that. Um, they're very educational. And I think a lot of people have to learn and listen when you post those things, because so many people don't think twice about what they're posting. Um, the next question we have is, what does accountability look like for the people in your environment or even for yourself for the path of growth <laughs> yeah so i really so one of the things that i really dislike about social media and social media activism is one we put people on a pedestal right um and then we create these faux interpersonal carceral systems that really just mimic isolation um and lack of access to new knowledge and things like that and what bothers me about that is we fail to see people as people while telling people that we are human, right? Um, and for me, the ideal is not perfection. It will never be perfection. For me, I try to be as humble enough to know what I don't know, right? And humble enough to realize where I could grow, where I can um, learn more and do better. And uh, additionally, I also have a very special gift of knowing when to shut the hell up. 
Like, I don't need to comment on everything. Um, and, and like half the time, it's so mercurial because, you know, a lot of people want to think of things as like more, um, more concrete than they are. A lot of these systems that we are evaluating, it's new to a lot of people, right? And while, yeah, they can be ableist and I can not uh, tolerate it, I do still understand where it comes from. And I do still understand that um, we're at the mercy of the same system that teaches us the same things. We just have to realize that at an earlier age that that's all wrong, you know, but a lot of people are not gonna get to the same page at the same time. Um, but for me, it's about the humility of knowing that I, I have to do better too in a lot of ways. I have to understand how to under, to speak to other people and listen and engage with compassion and respect um, for the different cultures and peoples that I'm interacting with. Um, that's kind of how I approach it. Um, I hope that I hope that answers the question. That does. I love that answer so much. Um, the next question we have is if you could go back at, to any point in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? <sighs> the one piece of advice would just get other people in trouble. But um, I would say the piece of advice I would have is, you know, do better by yourself. Um, I think the, our first um, our first instances of activism or uh, advocacy are generally not very kind to us as individuals. Um, a lot of times we see other people who are in our exact situation being harmed and we don't realize that that behavior is being used against us too. Because it's easier to look at somebody how somebody else is treated and be like, that's wrong, I can pinpoint that that feels wrong, it doesn't feel right, right? And say, nobody deserves to be treated that way. And then not realize we're being treated in the exact same way. Um, and so I, re I really started understanding that like, I don't deserve to be treated poorly either. Um, and I thought that finding my purpose meant like throwing myself onto the coals, the, you know, the, the scorching hot coals for other people um, rather than being kinder and doing more to understand myself and how I fit into the equation and how um, my own experiences could shed light on how we could all come together and, and understand one another. And working on that and, to, and also trying to build a community um, and understand that you know, interpersonal support is incredibly important and interdependence is incredibly important and not trying to do everything on my own. So try, just try to be kinder to myself in general. Kindness is so important, especially to ourselves because we grew up always like hating ourselves and repeating horrible things that we hear to ourselves. So I really yeah. like that piece of advice. Yeah. Um, so our next question is, as a part of our aim to expand healing and trauma-informed practice in public space, we are learning how to create virtual and in-person spaces where everyone in that space feels safe, seen, and heard. I'm curious to know how, in both virtual space and in-person spaces, what would need to exist in those spaces for you to feel safe, seen, and heard? Um, well, for me, I always try to make sure that disabled people are, like, I want to know that they're part of the planning process. I can't tell you how many times I've been to, like, events, digital or otherwise, where it was just like, I was just an add-on um, or like they, they kind of just shoved accessibility into the nooks and crannies that they missed in the first round. Um, and then that lack of intentionality means that things just fall apart towards the end. Um, what I look for is uh, rest, like spaces for rest. Like if, if people are going a mile a minute um, and everything feels so intense and so ramped up it doesn't feel like a safe space because it feels like I have to like overperform um wellness like when I need to like sit down and take a break um also places that don't have chairs or like places for rest red flag red flag because I need I need a I need a water bottle I need I need time I need chocolate um <laughs> I, I shouldn't but anyways I need all those things to make sure that I'm in a good place and also having people that represent me and my communities is incredibly important. Um, 
not just just I think a lot of people think of diversity as like paint by numbers so okay I got, I got this one color but then we can use this color and we can have a disabled person over there and that doesn't really sound to me like people who are really intentional about building space and building community it feels like people were like oh these are all the right talking points how can I optimize them as best as I can um and really, like I, I want to, I want indications that people listened to who they they, they are platforming in, in any given space. Um, yeah, I hope that that's a helpful answer. It definitely is. Um, our next question and one of our last questions is: What's the topic that you wish people would ask it ask you about but never do? Oh. Um, People always ask me about cheese, so not that. Um, I think the thing, I think like pop culture, like I, I always love pop culture um, and like my, and movie representations and like just, I really do, I'm really interested in like semiotics and the, the study of symbols and symbol implied meanings. Um, I love talking about that type of stuff, but nobody ever asks me. Uh, I and to be fair, I'd really never talk about it. So, um, but yeah, I like uh, that type of stuff and seeing how that plays out in media and branding and companies and stuff like that. You should definitely post some TikToks on that <laughs> or tweets even. I will. I will. I definitely will. Sounds good. So our last question is: What does your dream future look like for Black disabled folks? Oh, security. I think liberation and I I think a liberation is like a, a lack of fear of making small mistakes. I think we live in a society right now where everything feels very consequential. Like you can't, like there is no figuring out who you are. You have to know at 17 or 18. There is no, um, you know, run, like paying for medical care or credit card without that haunting you for the rest of your life there's so many like long-term consequences for just living your life um in this white supremacist society that is built off of capitalism and exploitation and the wrong like one minor wrong step could land you can end your can ruin your life um uh whether that be with police whether that be with systems with whether that be with all these different places and even sometimes you don't even necessarily have to have made a mistake but simply just existed as you were. And so liberation and the future for black disabled people is, is a lack of fear, a fear of moving about society and moving about um, spaces and feeling like things are accessible and inclusive and understand like your cultural outlook towards disability too. So that's kind of what I envision for us, housing, food, accessibility, it is a, Lack, it's so expensive to be disabled. Uh, you know, having things paid for. That is a future which I would like to live in. Um, so we're actually going to start wrapping up our event now. I wanna say thank you so much, Ivani. You are so amazing. And hearing you answer all of these questions was so empowering. I would also like to thank our fantastic student respondents Bailey, Faith, Aisha, Ali, and also Kelly and Sean, who are ASL interpreters. I would also like to thank Michelle and Margo, who are my co-organizers, and as well as our various sponsors, including Brock SJC, Packred, SVPC, CPI, and Boost. Soup. Lastly, thank you so much everyone for joining us here today. I hope you can take the knowledge and power away to create change in the spaces that you occupy and challenge ableism and racism in your everyday lives. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Have a very safe afternoon. Please everybody stay safe. Um, I personally am staying masked. I hope you do too. Have a good one. Anything y'all need from me before I click out? No, just a huge thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Of course, of course. Thank you. Y'all have a good afternoon. You too. Bye, money. Bye. Bye.